Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, as we study today about the meaning of marriage in the book of Genesis, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We realize that in the world today, marriage doesn't mean very much. The devil is angry, and he's trying to destroy marriage, because he knows that as marriage goes, so goes society, so goes the world. So help us to understand your plan for marriage from the very beginning. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In order to understand the meaning of marriage, we need to begin at the very beginning of creation week. And so I'm going to review the days of creation, culminating with what God did on the sixth day of creation week. The first day, the Bible tells us that God spoke light into existence. The second day, He spoke the firmament into existence. On the third day, He spoke the dry land and the trees and the flowers and the plants into existence. On the fourth day, God placed the sun and the moon and the stars in their positions by the power of His Word. On the fifth day, God spoke the birds and spoke the fish into existence. On the first part of the sixth day, God spoke the land animals into existence. And then of course, the Bible tells us that towards the end of the sixth day, most likely, God created man and woman. Let's notice that as it's found in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. Genesis 1 and verse 27. This is towards the very end of the sixth day. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then of course, a little bit further down in verse 31, we find that it says, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Now remember that. Indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So you have God creating in six days. Towards the end of the sixth day, God makes man and woman. And then at the end of the six days, God looks upon his work and he sees that it is very good. Now you notice that God did not explain how he created man and woman. Genesis 1 verse 27 simply says that God made man and woman, male and female. But it doesn't explain how. And so we're left with the question. And of course, in Genesis chapter 2, God is going to recapitulate. In other words, He's going to repeat some of the things that He left unsaid in Genesis chapter 1. And one of those things which was not explained is how He created man and how He created the woman. Now let's notice, first of all, how God created Adam, the man. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 explains it. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Now I want you to notice here that with man God did something different than with the rest of creation. The rest of creation he spoke into existence. But if you read Isaiah 64 and verse 8 you're going to discover that God made man, He formed man like a potter out of clay. In other words, God gave Adam the personal touch. He took clay, formed man, and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living being. So we know how man was created. Now the question is, how was the woman created during creation week? Let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. By the way, this is happening on the sixth day of creation week. God has already formed man of the dust of the ground. Now he's going to proceed to create the woman. But there's some things that have to happen first. Notice chapter 2 and verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is is not good that man should be alone. Now that's a strange statement. 
Because at the end of creation week, we found in Genesis 1.31 that it says that God looked upon everything that he made and it was very good. But here on the sixth day, after God has created Adam, God looks and he says, there's something here that is not good. Imagine that something in creation week that was not good. Obviously this is before the end of the sixth day of creation. Because on the sixth day God looked and it was very good. Here he says, it is not good. So this is before the end of the sixth day. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so notice what he continues saying. Once again verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now that's an interesting expression. The King James says a help meet. Now what is a help meet? A help meet is one corresponding to Adam. It is one like Adam. It is a complement to Adam. It is one who is a counterpart to Adam. In fact woman is man's alter ego or what we might call man's other self. In other words, they were supposed to be intertwined as one counterpart, one of the other. Now I'd like to read a statement that we find in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46. This book, Patriarchs and Prophets, is a marvelous book. It tells the story of the Old Testament from the origin of sin, actually in heaven, before the Old Testament. And it goes all the way through the story of David, the, the king of Israel, about a thousand years before the birth of Christ. It's a marvelous book. And here Ellen White explains what the expression help meet or counterpart means. On page 46 she says this, God himself gave Adam a companion. He provided a help meet for him. A helper corresponding to him. One who was fitted to be his companion and who could be one with him in love and sympathy. Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor, be, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him. A part of man, bone of his bone, and flesh of his flesh, she was his second self, showing the close union and the affectionate attachment that should exist in this relation. Notice the terminology, close union and affectionate attachment that should exist in this relation. Now even though the book of Genesis does not explicitly address in the first two chapters whether a marriage should be between a believer and an unbeliever, it is very clear by this expression help meet that Adam and Eve were supposed to be on the same page mentally physically and spiritually as well as emotionally. What I'm saying is that they undoubtedly according to the plan of God would practice a common faith. We find from Genesis that they were going to keep a common day of worship and they were going to serve a God, a common God between them. It is inconceivable that in the mind of God, if Adam and Eve are one flesh, if Eve is Adam's other self, so to speak, that one would go to church on one day and the other would go to church on another day. That one would keep the Sabbath and the other one would keep another day. That one would have certain religious practices contrary to the religious practices of the other. In other words, because they were actually one, according to scripture, it is understood that the marriage, the original marriage, was between individuals who spiritually were in tune. They were on the same page. In fact, a question that I ask 
when I'm doing marriage counseling uh, to a couple where they belong to different churches, they're both Christians but they belong to different churches, I ask them questions such as this, when you get married and you have children, where are your kids going to be educated? In an Adventist school or in a Catholic school? Is that an important question? Doesn't look like it when you're, when you're romancing, but I'll tell you it's going to come up later on. I ask them this, where and when are you going to go to church? Is that an important question? Absolutely. What is your family going to eat? If one believes that you can eat pork, and loves pork, and the other one is a vegetarian, you're going to have somewhat of a crisis under the same roof. I also ask, ask the question, what type of entertainment will you participate in? Will you dance? Will you drink? Will you go to the movie theater? Are you understanding what I'm saying? How can you be soulmates? How can woman be man's other self? How can man and woman be one and still be at odds in their spiritual habits and in their manner of practicing their religion and worshiping God. It's impossible. And so when God made Adam and Eve at the very beginning of human history God made them to worship the same God on the same day and in the same manner and to have worship together. He did not make them different spiritually. Now let's go back to Genesis and continue examining the story. We find that God says it is not good that man be alone. I will make an other self for him. Now notice Genesis chapter 2 and verses 19 and 20. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 19 and 20. God now gives Adam, this is the sixth day still, God gives Adam a little task to perform. It says there in verse 19, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. You know God purposely had Adam name the animals. Because he knew that as Adam was naming the animals, he was going to see that there was no help meet for him. There was no one like him. He was going to notice that each animal had its mate. But he did not have someone to share his experience physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally with. And so God purposely told him to name the animals so that he would feel lonely. And of course loneliness is not good. It is not good that man should be alone. And so we find in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21 that God performs the first general anesthesia of human history. And the first surgery of human history. Notice Genesis chapter 2 once again and verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. Do you notice that a deep sleep? Would you call that anesthesia? Absolutely. And this was a general anesthesia. You know Adam was not semi-conscious, semi-awake. He was out of it. And it says, and the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took out one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh in its place. What did God take out? He took out a rib. And what did he make out of the rib? It says that out of the rib, verse 22, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now there's a couple of things that I want to underline here. It says here that God made the woman. Now listen up. 
the word that is used for made here in the Hebrew is not the common ordinary word for making something. It is a word that means, by the way it's the Hebrew bana, which means to build. It is used many times in the Old Testament to describe the building, for example, of Solomon's temple. In other words, God did not speak Eve into existence either. God built Eve. Now isn't it interesting that God does not speak Eve into existence. God does not make Eve out of the dust of the ground like he did the man. But God takes a rib out of the man and out of the rib he builds a woman. He constructs a woman. In other words, with his own hands. Why in the world would God do something like this? By the way, a rib is very close to what? Very close to the heart. Did you notice that the quotation from Patriarchs and Prophets says that God did not take a bone from his foot because he was not supposed to trample on Eve? Neither did God take a bone from the head because Eve was not supposed to be the head of man. But God actually took a bone very close to Adam's heart, which is the place that God wanted Eve to occupy in Adam's attention. And of course Eve was taken from Adam. She is actually a part of Adam. Do you notice also in this verse that it tells us that God brought Eve to Adam? Now this is a very important point. You know these days people go out spouse hunting. But originally God is saying that we don't go spouse hunting. God shows us whom we should marry. By circumstances in our lives. By signs in our lives. We are able to see whom God has for us. And sometimes we rush things. And as a result we make the wrong decision. But it says here that God made the woman out of man and God brought the woman to man. And there are some people in this church whose names I'm not going to mention that uh, I've had the privilege of marrying and they have just wonderful happy marriages. And I see, wow, you know, God certainly intervened in the life of this man or in the life of this woman to bring them together in this church at this time in almost a miraculous way. And so we find that God makes Eve out of a rib of Adam to show that she is of the same substance of man. He takes a bone close to the heart because that's the place that Eve should occupy in the attention of Adam. Now there's something very important as we examine the story of the creation of man and woman and the establishment of the first marriage. And that is that marriage in Genesis according to God's original plan was supposed to be heterosexual. That's very very clear in the first two chapters of Genesis. Let's notice once again Genesis 1 verse 27. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. You know there's this big discussion today in the world whether gay marriage is acceptable or not in the sight of God. Well the fact is Genesis makes it very very clear that God established marriage to be heterosexual not homosexual. Now notice Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. What did God create? Male and what? Male and female according to this. Notice Genesis chapter 2 and verses 22 and 23. It says, Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought, notice this, he brought her to the man. The first marriage was between a him and a what? And a her, according to this. Verse 23, And Adam said, 
This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She, what? She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Is there any doubts in the book of Genesis that marriage as God created it originally was to be heterosexual marriage? There's absolutely no doubt. And then of course we find the words, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. Man shall be joined to his what? To his wife and they shall be one flesh. And by the way, when it speaks about being one flesh and joined to his wife, it's talking about the intimacy of marriage. It's talking about the privilege now of having marital relations or sexual relations, the man and the woman. Listen, you don't have to be very intelligent to figure out that God created marriage to be heterosexual. All you have to do is look at simple common biology. All you have to look at is at the physical makeup of the man and the physical makeup of the woman. And you know that certain organs made, God made for man and certain organs he made for woman to be employed in the sacred union of marriage. It's simple biology, even if you didn't have Holy Scripture to refer to. And so we find in the book of Genesis that marriage is to be heterosexual. We also find in the book of Genesis that marriage is supposed to be with ki between kindred hearts, between believers. And by the way, do you know that the New Testament corroborates that point? Be ye not unevenly yoked with unbelievers. And the Apostle Paul, if you look uh, in your Bibles with me, uh, at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 39, God tells us that marriage must be between believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 39. It says here, a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes. And then what does it say? Only in the Lord. Is there a condition for getting married? Yes, it must be in the Lord. Now there's another important aspect to marriage that we find in the story of Genesis. And what I'm going to share with you is probably very politically incorrect. But it's taught in the book of Genesis. What are you talking about, you're saying, Pastor? Well, even though Adam and Eve were created as equals, the woman was to be subject to her husband. Even before sin. You'll hear people say, no, that was after sin. No, even before sin. The wife was to be subject to her husband even though she was equal to her husband. By the way, Adam and Eve were created equal. Allow me to share this with you. Were both of them called man? We just read it in Genesis. Both of them were called man. Male and female, but man. Were both created in the image and likeness of God? We just read it. Were both of them given dominion? Yes, they were. Were both of them commanded to be fruitful and multiply? Yes. Were both of them blessed? Yes. Were both of them made from the same substance? Yes, they were. In other words, God created Adam and Eve equal. And yet He created the woman to be subject to man. Now you say, how can you be equal if one is subject to the other? The fact is that it's very simple. You can be ontologically equal. Ontologically means as a being before God. You can be equal while at the same time functionally one can be subject to another. And you say, how's that? Well, let's take a look at the relationship between Jesus and His Father. We studied this when we dealt with the issue of discipline. Remember we studied the issue of discipline? How God disciplines His children as a model uh, as to how we're supposed to discipline our children? Well. Let me ask you, are God the Father and His Son Jesus equal? Are they? Well, let's notice a couple of texts. John chapter 10 and verse 30. 
John chapter 10 and verse 30. What does Jesus say there? It's a very short verse. He says, I and my Father are what? I and my Father are one. Are Jesus and His Father equal? They're one, just like Adam and Eve were one. The same terminology. But let me ask you something. Is Jesus, even though He is equal with His Father, is Jesus subject to His Father? Have you ever read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3? Where it says that the head of Christ is whom? The head of Christ is God. And the head of the woman is whom? The man. Now, if you don't like the idea that the head of the woman is the man, you obviously would not like the idea that the head of Christ is the Father. Now the Father and the Son are equal. But the Son is subject to the Father. And in the same way, Adam and Eve are equal. But the woman is to be what? The woman is to be subject to her husband. You say, now how do we know that the woman is to be subject to her husband? And that the husband is the head? Well, let me share some details with you. Who was created first, Adam or Eve? Do you know the Apostle Paul says that uh, because man was created first and then woman, man has the leadership or the headship role? By the way, who named who? Did Eve name Adam or did Adam name Eve? In Scripture, naming someone is an indication of the exercise of authority on the part of that person. And so when Adam says she shall be called woman, Adam is exercising his what? His authority in naming the woman. Furthermore, when Adam and Eve sinned, whom did God hold accountable? Who did he hold accountable? He held Adam accountable. And by the way, we find Jesus not as the second Eve, he is the second what? He is the second Adam, because Adam was the father and representative of the human race. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And so for all of these reasons, Adam and Eve were equal. But the woman was to be, the wife was to be subject to the husband. Now I realize that in a world where the husband abuses his privilege as the head and beats up his wife and mistreats his wife, this is a very hard word. But in God's original plan, it was to be a loving headship. The woman would lovingly subject herself to her husband because she realized that her husband wanted the best for her. And the husband, of course, would love his wife would give his life for his wife. In fact, Adam loved Eve more than he loved God. Because he could not stand the idea of living one day without Eve. And when Eve sinned, Adam said, I guess I will sin also. He loved Eve with all of his heart. This was his helpmeet. It was his other self. It was like tearing him apart. The idea that Eve would die and Adam would continue living. So he decided to sin as well and suffer the same fate as Eve. Problems show up in marriage when we disrespect the order that God established at the very beginning. When the woman tries to exercise the headship role instead of the man. That's one of the big problems in the world. And when the man refuses to love his wife and wants to actually beat up on his wife. But if marriages were like God intended it at the beginning, that the man would exercise a loving headship role, and the woman would subject herself in love to her husband, marriage would be everything that God wanted it to be. Allow me to read you a statement that we find um, in the book, book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 59, about Eve. See, we live in a time of women's liberation. That's what it used to be called. Women's rights. And you know the idea is, I'm not going to let any man control me or dominate me. I'm going to declare my independence. And as a result, women have occupied the positions that men should occupy, and they've abandoned the home. Do you think it's de degrading for a woman to take care of her children and take care of the home? That is the most beautiful task that you could ever fulfill 
to make sure your children are saved in the kingdom because you are fulfilling your role as the mother. Now notice what she says about Eve. Eve had been perfectly happy by her husband's side in her Eden home. But like restless modern Eves, she was flattered with the hope of entering a higher sphere than that which God had assigned for her. In attempting to rise above her original position, she fell far below it. A similar result will be reached by all who are unwilling to take up cheerfully their life duties in accordance with God's plan. In their efforts to reach positions for which He has not fitted them, many are leaving vacant the place where they might be a blessing. In their desire for a higher sphere, many have sacrificed true womanly dignity and no mo nobility of character and have left undone the very work that heaven appointed them. Powerful words, which if they were practiced, the world would be far different. Far few marriages would end up in divorce if we respected the order that God established. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 22 to 25. The Apostle Paul is clear on this point. Some people say, ah, oh, what did Paul know? He was a male chauvinist. Well, I believe that what he wrote was inspired by the Holy Spirit. How about it? Notice Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Of course, that means in the Lord. He's just explained in the Lord. If your husband wants you to do something that is contrary to the Lord, you can say, no way. But in everything else, they are to submit to their husbands according to this. And then notice the Apostle Paul balances it off by talking to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying, husbands, love your wives and give yourselves for your wife. And if they did that, it would be very easy for the wife to submit to the husband. Now notice one other text. This is a critically important text. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33. This is a very interesting verse. Uh, and notice what the Apostle Paul has to say here. In chapter 5 and verse 33. A very interesting word is used. He says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband now that doesn't catch the whole nuance of what God is trying to say the translation respects the Greek word that is used here is the word phobeo which means to what? to fear your husband now it's not talking about fear in terms of being afraid it's the same word that's used in Revelation 14 verse 7. Fear God and give glory to Him. It means to have God in awe, in the deepest respect. That's what it means. But the word fear, the wife is to fear her husband. And the husband is to love his wife as himself. By the way, when a husband beats up his wife and practices spousal abuse, he's actually beating himself up. Because the wife is one with you you are one flesh and so the Apostle Paul says that when a man mistreats his wife he is really mistreating whom he is really mistreating himself now another important point that we find in Genesis is that marriage is a divine institution marriage is not a social contract Marriage is not something that merely happens when we go to the office of the justice of the peace. Marriage is a divine institution. Go with me to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. 
Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Very important verse. After Adam says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. We find these words. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Is that word therefore indicating that marriage is normative for the future? Or is this only something that God did with Adam and Eve? Or is this normative for the future? On the basis of what Adam has said, God is saying, therefore from now on, a man shall leave his father and his mother. By the way, how do we know that? Because when God said this, there was no father or mother. Correct? Were there any fathers or mothers? No. So when, when these words are pronounced, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. God is saying that what he did at the very beginning is going to be normative for all of those who will have in the future what? Fathers and mothers. In other words, God is making a divine institution. By the way, who spoke these words? Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall be one flesh. You know, you read Genesis and you don't really know. Because it's immediately after Adam says, This is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, she shall be called woman. And then it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. You know, you say, Well, is Moses saying this? Or you might say, Is Adam still talking here? Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife? Who's saying these words? Genesis doesn't make it very clear. But Matthew does. Go with me to Matthew chapter 19. And you'll see that marriage is a divine institution. Matthew chapter 19, and I want to read verses 4 through 6. It says here, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Who made them at the beginning? God. Which person of the Godhead? Jesus. Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John 1, 1 to 3 says, In the beginning the Word who was God made all things. So the creator of Genesis was Jesus. You say, well, why does Jesus then say, He who made them at the beginning? Why doesn't He say, When I made them at the beginning? This is a figure of speech. I don't have time to go to the text, but I'm going to mention them. For example, in John 6, verse 33 and verse 46, Jesus uses the same expression speaking about Himself. He which did this. But He's speaking not about someone else. He's referring to Himself. And so He who made them in the beginning, who is Jesus, according to this, made them male and female. And now notice verse 5. And said. Who said? He who made them in the beginning, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So who spoke those words in Genesis? It was the Creator. And now notice verse 6. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. And then we have, have some words that are in Matthew which were not in Genesis. It says, therefore, what God hath joined together, let not man, what? Let not man separate. Is Jesus implicitly here saying that divorce was not in God's plan originally? What God has joined together, marriage, is something that is performed by whom? By God. According to this, what God has joined together, let not man cast asunder. In other words, when we get divorced, according to the book of Genesis, we are going contrary to the plan of God. Now I realize that Jesus said that there's a certain reason why we can uh, get divorced and remarried in, remarried in the case of breaking the marriage vow, in the case of adultery, according to Christ. 
But people get divorced today for every reason under the sun. They get divorced because the husband or the wife snores. And for trivial things such as that. As if marriages were disposable. You know one of the problems is that people enter marriage today with a defeatist attitude. They basically say, well you know I'm getting married, if it doesn't work I'll get a divorce. I know when I got married 33 years ago, I really believed that this is till death does a, do us part. This is for life, for better or for worse. If we have troubles, we'll work on the troubles. And we'll work them and iron them out and we'll make the marriage work. But today people give up for small reasons sometimes. What God has joined together let not man cast asunder. Folks, marriage is a divine institution. Marriage is not a human institution. It is not a social contract. It is holy and indissoluble. Notice what Patriarchs and Prophets page 46 says. God celebrated the first marriage. Thus the institution has for its originator the creator of the universe. Isn't that amazing? Now let me ask you something. Is the liberal left, as it is called today, trying to change marriage? Is it? What is it trying to do with marriage? It's trying to change marriage from the union of a man and a woman to perhaps the union of a man with a man and a woman with a woman. The liberal left is trying to change the meaning of marriage. But the evangelical right is trying to change something else that originated at creation. You see, as it says in Genesis, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, which means that it is normative from that point on, there's another commandment that was established at creation, there was another institution established at creation where the fourth commandment says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and everything that in them is, therefore the Lord what? Rested on the seventh day, he blessed it and he made it holy. The very word therefore is used for the Sabbath as it was a marriage. And so in the world today we have the devil trying to destroy the two creation institutions. One on the part of the liberal left who says we're going to change the meaning of marriage to a man and a man and a woman and a woman. And the radical right who are saying we're going to change the Sabbath institution and we're going to say that we're supposed to keep Sunday. Now you tell me where is the difference? There is no difference. The devil doesn't care if you change one or if you change the other. They are both creation institutions, are they not? And the devil hates both of them, do you know why? Because marriage guarantees the stability of the horizontal order. Whereas the Sabbath preserves the orderliness of the vertical order between man and God. And so the devil wants to destroy the relationship between man and God of which the Sabbath is a reminder. And he wants to destroy the relationship of a husband and a wife by redefining the meaning of marriage. And some people will go even so far as to say, well you know, the Sabbath was actually a symbol that God gave of the rest that we were going to enjoy when Jesus came to the world. And once Jesus comes to the world, we get rid of the symbol. Where the fact is, marriage was also a symbol of the relationship between Christ and His people. And so if marriage is a symbol of the relationship with, between Christ and His people, when Christ actually comes, let's get rid of marriage also. Are you understanding what I'm saying? The fact that the reality comes does not necessarily get rid of the Sabbath. It does not necessarily mean that we get rid of marriage. Some people even say, well, the Sabbath was so twisted, out of shape, at the times of Christ, that Jesus saw that it could not be fixed. And so he, got, he decided that he would discard it. 
Well, the same is true of marriage in the days of Christ. You read Matthew chapter 19. People were getting divorced for every reason under the sun. So marriage was also in the same condition. So why not throw out marriage and throw out the Sabbath? But today everybody says, no, marriage is between a man and a woman. And you ask why? They say, well, because that's the way God made it at the beginning. And then you ask, and what else did he make at the beginning? Oh, he made the trees. And he made the fish. And he made the birds. You say, yes, thank you very much. But I'm thinking more in the line of what he made at the end of creation week. What else did he make? Immediately after making marriage, the very next verses say that he made what? That he made the Sabbath. So if you discard the Sabbath, what's so wrong about discarding marriage? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now another important point in Genesis is that marriage is to be monogamous. Is that clearly in Genesis? That marriage is supposed to be monogamous? Do you know what monogamous means? It means one man to one woman. You say, how do we know that? Doesn't it say, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wives? <laughs> it's not what it says it says shall be joined to his what? to his wife now what part of wife don't you understand? wife is singular God married one man with one woman not one man with many women or many women with one man God established marriage as monogamous Notice Ephesians chapter 5. This plan has not changed. Ephesians chapter 5. We just read it a few moments ago. 5 and verse 33. It says here. The apostle Paul is speaking. We read it in a different context a few moments ago. He says this. Nevertheless let each one of you in particular so love his own what? Wife. Singular. As himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. Did God create marriage as a monogamous relationship? Absolutely yes. Marriage was supposed to be between one man and one woman, one woman. And some people say, yeah pastor, but look at all of the men in the Old Testament who married several women. Why don't you look at the men who only married one woman? For example, Isaac. Isaac married one woman, Rebecca. Noah married how many women? One. How about Noah's sons? One each. By the way, do you know who the first polygamist was? It was a man called Lamech. And he was in the genealogy of who? Of Cain. It says that he had two wives. You say, but look, Abraham married two women, and God never said it was wrong. Listen, all you have to do is look at what the marriage was like. I mean, Sarah and Hagar what at, were at each other's throats. The household was miserable. By their fruits ye shall know them. And then of course you have Jacob, who had two wives and two concubines. Have mercy. And if you read this story, you're going to find that there were fights in this household among all of the brothers like you wouldn't believe. Is that what God intended? It's not what God intended. Notice what we find in the book Story of Redemption, page 76, about Noah and his sons. Noah had but one wife. And their united family discipline was blessed of God. Because Noah's sons were righteous, they were preserved in the ark with their righteous father. God has not sanctioned polygamy in a single instance. How's that? 
see, Jesus always went, went back to the beginning as the ideal. Well, why did Moses then give a letter of divorce for any reason? Jesus says, Moses did that because of the hardness of your hearts. But at the beginning, it was not so. You see, the ideal is to go back to the beginning, not to some secondary half measure. In diet, we should go back to the beginning. Sabbath observance, we should go back to the beginning. Dress, we should go back to the beginning. Marriage, we should go back to the beginning. The beginning is the model to which we should aspire. Not what came in in consequence of sin. She continues saying, God has not sanctioned polygamy in a single instance. It is contrary to his will. He knew that the happiness of man would be destroyed by it. Abraham's peace was greatly marred by his unhappy marriage with Hagar. And by the way, as we look at marriage in the book of Genesis, we also discover that you have the Sabbath related to marriage. Have you ever noticed that immediately after God performs the first marriage of Adam and Eve, then begins or begin the holy hours of the Sabbath? In other words, at the end of the sixth day, God is saying to Adam and Eve, Adam, I made you for Eve, and Eve, I made you for Adam. But then by the Sabbath, he says, I made you both for me. Are you following me? And he says, every Sabbath, your family is going to meet with my family. And we're going to celebrate together. In that way, your marriage will be stronger, and your relationship with me will be stronger. So what have we studied? Reviewing. Marriage is a divine institution. Secondly, marriage is normative for all times and places. Number three, marriage is indissoluble. It is for life. Number four, marriage is to be monogamous. One man to one woman. Marriage is to be heterosexual. Between a man and a woman. Marriage is to be within the faith. I mean, if you're one flesh and the woman is your other self, how can one self be going to church on Sunday and the other self be in the church on Saturday? How can one be eating one thing and another another thing? How can the children, some children go to school in this religious school and others in the other religious school? Are you understanding me? Furthermore, marriage has a particular order. The man is the head. The woman is to be subject to the man, but the man is to love the woman. Folks, Satan hates marriage with a passion. That's why he's trying to destroy it. And Satan hates the Sabbath with a passion. And that's why he's trying to destroy the Sabbath. And I find it very ironic, as I mentioned before, that the religious left or the liberal left wants to change marriage. Whereas the radical evangelical right will eventually move to change the Sabbath institution that God made at the very beginning. Tragic and sad. Do you know that the book of Genesis mentions several distortions of marriage that appeared after sin entered the world? Allow me to just mention them in closing. Incest. Lot with his daughters. Genesis 19. At the end of the chapter. His daughters made him drunk. And they had sexual relations with their own father. Reuben. Had sex with one of Jacob's concubines. Incest. Came in. Contrary to God's plan. Adultery. Remember Joseph? Potiphar's wife wanted to commit adultery with Joseph. Joseph says, how can I commit this great sin against my God? He knew that adultery was wrong. Fornication. 
which is sexual relations between people who are unmarried. You remember the story of Shechem and Dinah? It ended up costing the lives of all of the inhabitants of Shechem because of that one act of fornication. Polygamy came in. Notice these distortions of marriage that the devil brought in after sin. You have Lamech, the first polygamist. You have Jacob. You have Abraham. And then of course homosexuality. Sodom and Gomorrah. Bring out these men that we might know them. Marriages of believers and unbelievers. Genesis 6, we've studied this. The sons of God marrying the daughters of men in unequal yoke. The result was the flood. Prostitution. Remember the story of Judah and Tamar? Judah who goes to visit a prostitute? Listen, even in Genesis, the devil is trying to destroy what? He's trying to destroy marriage. Because he knows that as marriage goes, so goes the world. So in conclusion, I have a challenge for everyone here tonight. Number one, if you are married, work on it so that you will stay married. If you are divorced, don't make the same mistake all over again. And number three, if you are single, go into this with fear and trembling.